Hey everybody, it's your girl Cache coming at you with another video. Today is episode one of Books and Hooks. I will be crocheting and giving you a book review and for this book we will be talking about Black Book by Mateo Ascarapur. I'm pretty sure I'm saying that right. I do apologize if I'm saying it wrong. I to my head and not my heart. Uh, and so we're gonna get into it um but first i'm going to read the inside flap to give you just a little synopsis about the book if you have never heard about it and then we're just going to talk about my feelings while i was reading the book and go through there i'm going to try not to give any spoilers so hopefully i don't uh yeah i'm trying okay an unambitious 22-year-old, Darren lives in a bed brownstone with his mother, who wants nothing more than to see him live up to his potential as the valedictorian of Bronx science. But Darren is content working at Starbucks in the lobby of a midtown office building, hanging out with his girlfriend, Soraya, and eating his mother's home-cooked meals. All that changes when a chance encounter with Red Daniels, the silver tongue CEO of Someone, NYC's hottest tech startup, results in an exclusive invitation for Darren to join an elite sales team on the 36th floor. After enduring a hell week of training, Darren, the only black person in the company, reimagines himself as Buck, a ruthless salesman unrecognizable to his friends and family. But when things turn tragic at home and Buck feels he's hit rock bottom, he begins to hatch a plan to help young people of color infiltrate America's sales force, setting off a chain of events that forever changes the game. Black Buck is a hilarious, razor-sharp skewering of America's workforce. It is a propulsive, crackling debut that explores ambition and race and makes way for a necessary new vision of the American dream. I uh, listened to the audiobook of Black Buck, but I did order this from a link in Mateo's bio that I'm going to put in the description box. Uh, and I got an autographed copy. Uh, it's an indie bookseller, so I definitely wanted to support that way and was able to do that. Um, so, for what I'm working on crocheting-wise, before we get back into the book, I'm working on a 3x3 three 9-block three blanket. I got the first three done. So, we have the traditional granny square, we have a spiral granny square, and we have a spike stitch granny square. And so, uh, originally I was going to do nine different stitches, so each block would different, have a different stitch. Realized that even though these are all double crochets and they're all 16 uh, around, 16 rows around the entire thing, they're not the same size. So, I've decided that I'm going to continue the three that are there in three different colorways of the three colors. Uh, and so, that's what I'm going to be working on today. I have started with this base of orange and now I'm going to switch to the red or the yellow I haven't decided y'all will see in just a second like I'm going to figure out so without further ado let's get to crocheting and getting into the book let me talk about my overall thoughts on the book as is um so uh, I gave it a three on Goodreads and that's because like, I don't think you can do partials or whatever uh, but if I were to give my score it it alternates between a 3.5 and a 3.75 um, and I will say that it could be higher upon my second read through uh, an actual physical reading of the book because like I said I I did the audiobook so I didn't get to like go through and the way that it is written um, is kind of like uh, it's written as a sales manual so there's like different notes and things that are important that I get the context of in hearing but it's definitely not the same as seeing it in paper form and so I'm hoping that in doing in doing that I have a better sense of my feeling about the book and where I stand and, and how everything turned out and whatnot so um as the book starts, um, I, I'm first, like, I'm intrigued by Darren and, uh, the, the idea that he's content with his life. Um, and that's mainly because at the point in my life where I am now, I am becoming much more, uh, aware of how important, uh, contentment is in your own personal life. And I think that that is sometimes, uh it's not talked about 
enough and I think that sometimes we as a society uh, we put what we think makes people successful and what what they should do to ultimately be happy Ta not taking into effect that just because they're not doing what we think they shouldn't be doing doesn't mean that they're not happy. Doesn't mean that they're not living a quality life. Doesn't mean that the life isn't working for them. Um, because at the start of the story, um, uh, the life is working. The, the life is working for Darren. He's okay with it. Um, other people are not okay with it. Um, at least that's like the connotation that the story gets. Um, and then once he gets exposed to this world, he does become no longer okay with what's going on. And I'm mad that I didn't pull from the center now, but then I'm glad because now it looks like I'm just pulling yarn and it's going nowhere. You guys, this is a whole thing. Okay, there, I did the wrong again. So let me redo this. Y'all, crochet is definitely an art form. It's not a science. It's not exact at all, let me tell y'all. Um, and so, um, as, uh, you know, he goes on, embarks on this change in his life to become a part of this sales force team and whatnot, um, he's hit with microaggressions that, to me, high key ain't really micro at all. Like, these things are freaking huge. And I, as I was reading, like, I was like, at times I would be like, ooh, this boy got more God than I will ever have. Like, um, it's kind of like, it's this, like, joke on this thing that my grandmother used to say. She used to say when people would uh, be able to forgive or get past, like, that they have a level of God or a level of Jesus that she'll never have. And, like, there were quite a few times during the story where I was like, ooh, child, I just could never and would never. Um... Uh, one of the things that like specifically uh, sticks out that is considered a microaggression, but again, is something that I think is huge and very prevalent, uh, was the amount of times people who were not black saw this biracial man and said that he looked like some other famous black person. Y'all, the only person that even made sense for them to say was Drake. Like, the rest of it didn't even make sense. Like, how does this boy look like Sidney Poitier? Please explain this to me. Um, I want to say Morgan Freeman. Can we just say that Morgan Freeman, Sidney Poitier, and Drake don't look nothing alike? Can we, like, acknowledge that? I'm curious. Uh, so, as the story continues, uh, and... Uh, it, it becomes that Darren pushes himself to accept this life and accept these things that he's going through because everybody has pushed him to tell him that he needs to take this job. And one thing that it's kind of talked about, but I um, am curious if in the original draft, because I, I've uh, just talked to Mateo multiple times, um, shout out to him. Uh, he's been very, very like uh, easygoing and nice to talk to and understanding. And even when I said like I didn't like the story and I didn't like the main character, like he didn't get mad at me. And I just, oh, I just appreciate it so much. Um, but one thing uh, that he said was that the original was, you know, um, like 180K, the first draft. And so I wonder in the original if uh, Darren or Buck talked about the fact that they were doing this because everyone else said they needed to. Everyone else said they had to. They had to be a part of this world. They had to take this opportunity. They had to, he had to do this. And in that, I think that the pressure to do what nobody else has done and everybody expects you to do makes you accept things that you wouldn't normally take. Right? Because I don't think Buck at Starbucks would have ever let anybody talk to him the way that they talk to him at someone. And so I realized that while I was reading, I was super angry. Like, stand up for yourself. Have some pride. And you are a black man. Don't let anybody talk to you this way. Get it together. Like, y'all, I was having feels. I realized 
that my anger wasn't at Darren. My anger wasn't at Buck. My anger was at the society that makes his actions feel necessary. My anger was at the fact that to have a successful life, to succeed, the thought process was is I have to take as much essentially shit as people throw my way and grip my teeth and bury. it. And I realized that it reminded me of a conversation I had in grad school. So um, at uh, my university, Oklahoma State University, um, I was a member of the uh, Black Graduate Student Association. And we had these annual uh, colloquiums. And uh, my first year there, the, the uh, theme was Black Solidarity. And so we have like presidents of universities here. We have PhD tenured uh, uh, professors speaking on these panels. And so uh, we talk about, we were talking about like colorism and the different things that exist. And so I, I asked the question and the answer will always stick with me. And I asked that as, you know, black professionals, like at the highest point in your career, right? Because having a doctorate is like the highest form of education in that field. That means you've done so much research, so much study, and that you, you're there, right? And I was like, knowing that you are at that part in your career and you have done that work and you have been in your field for 20, 30, some 40 years, at what point did you get to stop playing the game? And every person on that panel said that you never stop playing the game and it goes back to the white supremacist society that is in this country and in its foundation um you know like i said if you want to argue it argue with your mama because it's not gonna be me um because like i'm gonna just shut it down because it's there and so as uh Darren becomes Buck and he does these he allows one I feel like he allows the money to go to his head um and he allows the power that he's given and the respect that he's given um to go to his head uh, and I I use quotations because very quickly in the storyline you realize these people didn't respect you they didn't know you um, because they changed, they turned on him so fast, so super fast, um, because it was, you are no longer doing what benefits us, key there, you're no longer doing what benefits us, and I think that that's something that isn't talked about enough, um, and so when he starts to come to his sentences, sentences, <laughs> sentences when he starts to come to his sentences and he decides that he is going uh, to help other people of color um he decides you know he's going to do this and with the first people that he helps they're black and i think there's a few biracial people so let me not say black and not include that there there are biracial people in here um but he after uh, berating his childhood best friend for doing illegal things to make money to just take care of his mom, he puts these black people through a hell week of illegal things just for them to get an opportunity to interview. Let me stop you and repeat that. Just to get an opportunity to interview not get the job but get the interview and that 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 was like uh the start of like the descent and like i can't get i can't be any more understanding to this brother like i'm trying to be understanding like you didn't have your daddy so you know you got daddy issues and that's why you were just flocking to this white man and his i don't even understand like i had there were so many different things that bothered me about Darren's situation and what he became. And I got irritated with the black people that 
that wanted these opportunities so bad that didn't see the dangers they were putting themselves in just to get an interview. And again, after sitting with my thoughts and sitting with reading the book and thinking about the notion in which the book was written, my anger isn't with the characters, but with the society that made them feel like this is all they had to do. Um, and then I also want to go into the fact that we don't talk about how we criminalize the illegal things that black people do to get a money and get ahead and take care of themselves, but not at all acknowledging the number of illegal things that Buck was taking part of just because he was a part of this area. Like, it, it became ridiculous at one point. Um, and I remember thinking that you know, I had to go back and look up what satire was because I wasn't entirely sure because I'm sitting here like, ain't none of this funny to me. I'm not laughing at not a narrow one of these scenes. Like, and it wasn't funny because it was real. Because, like, some people are going to read and be like, nobody would actually do this. And I can guarantee you there are articles of places in which these things have happened. I mean, y'all, we've had freaking kids do snapchat auctions for black students in their classroom in freaking 2021 so like it's ridiculous to think that anything in this book doesn't actually happen because it does and so i think that was the other part about it was like i'm supposed to be thinking these things are outlandish i'm supposed to be thinking like these things would never happen in the real world it's supposed to be like so over exaggerated and it wasn't like everything seemed very logical in how it happened story wise uh, for me as I was reading. And I think that aided me. Um, I think that truly, truly aided me. And so um, when I say that I didn't like the story, I'm not at all saying that the story is bad because the writing was phenomenal. The writing made everything hit home. Like from the interviews with the newscasters and things like that. Like all of it is like, yo, that's like low key listening to that, that Tommy, Lauren, Tommy, what, whatever that girl's name is. Like it low key gave me some of her vibes in so many different situations. And I, I think that, um, that my own experiences in the tech startup world and being you know the only black woman in this company for uh in th this portion of the company for a year um the only black college female college hire in this company and it's like when i i think another thing that stood out for me in the story was you know the emphasis on minorities and i understand that minorities in general all go through things and have experiences and whatnot i do think that there are more, some minorities that are more palatable to the white supremacist society than others and uh if you don't believe me uh please tell me how many laws have been written in uh specifically for the safety of black people in the words of Cat Williams, don't worry, I'll wait. So uh, because of that, I think that I did uh, I did feel sort sort of slighted uh, in the story a lot. Like I felt some type of way, but I completely understood. You know, the author is biracial, the main character is biracial, so I got it. Um, so that that wasn't uh, a thing. But I think it goes back to one, black people in general. In general. Black people are willing to ride for anybody that they see are experiencing injustice because we have seen so much of it, we understand it. And in general, it was a, we all need to succeed and do better. Um, but I peep that in saying that he wasn't the only minority at someone. He was just the only black person. Um, so there's that. Uh, also, I think the conversation of 
all skin folk and kin folk comes up. But even in that, I thought that that was... I thought that that was the conversation and as I continued to through the story I realized no it's hurt people hurt people that's what legitimately happened there wasn't a betrayal on the basis of I'm riding with white people because of this it was a betrayal more so on the fact of you hurt someone that I loved and this person never got the justice they deserved so I'm taking it into my own hands and on some level I think each and every one of us could understand that whether we would act in the same way or not um, we can understand it because for me I definitely wouldn't have sabotaged the that thing the that and I definitely wouldn't have had him like trying to get him sent uh, to uh, the thing that happens at the very end I'm trying not to give y'all spoilers but I do understand that feeling and going back to the fact that these are still very young people um, and I think that's another thing that I the story made me think about your ideals and your feelings at 21 22 23 are definitely not the same at 30 um, I realized that um, part of the reason why I did not last at that company as long as some other black people is because there were levels of my blackness I was not willing to compromise. Um, and I say that as in, you're going to call me cachet. Um, it's cachet, right? No, it's cachet. Um, can I call you something else? Like, you got a nickname? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could call me cash or you could call me Shay. But if you could say either one of those, you can still say cachet. And that's honestly what I would prefer. You know, um... And I think that in that, there are pros and cons, right? Like, you have to understand that in that, you're not going to make it into every space. You're not going to be allowed into every space. Because your blackness is offensive in some ways. Um, and you have to be okay with that. Or you have to be okay at making yourself smaller for their benefit and for me that was never an option one of my favorite quotes in uh, Marianne Williamson's uh, poem and or speech I'm not exactly sure what you would call it is your playing small does not prove the world there is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you and if there is anything that Black Buck reminded me, it was that there is nothing to gain about shrinking your blackness, shrinking your culture, shrinking yourself. There is nothing uh, that you should have to do to make yourself more palatable for white people because... I guarantee you they are not doing the same for you right um, and so uh, as uh, I like give you guys this review and I'm crocheting and whatnot I want to say that even in stories where you don't like this story because like y'all I hated the ending I wanted I wanted Buck to rise up and I wanted so much more than what I got, but even in that, I understand the good of the story. I understand the the good of what the book does. Yeah, so with that being said, I, I absolutely um, uh, am a fan of the author. I will definitely be reading the next book. Um, and also, let me be clear, so I personally like the 10 the 10 uh the 10 star rating scale i don't like the 5 scale so on a uh on a 5 scale it would be a 3.5375 on a 10 scale i would definitely give it a 7 it is above average writing for sure uh the storytelling is really great i think that he paints the scenes very well you do uh you fall into the story very easily um i i like i said the the satire is what got me like I was like oh okay this is gonna be funny 
ah, okay, I'm a lot. Like, nah, this was triggering AF, y'all. Like, for real, for real. All right, y'all, so I have added the red to the blanket. This is where I am so far. And so uh, my final thoughts are I would definitely be interested in a continuation of this story. I feel that I, I, I would love to see Darren slash Buck's progression now, you know, that he's in his new home and he has this new life uh, at the end of the book. I'm curious of what that means. I'm curious of what happens because, of course, we know, like, his organization grows and it becomes this bigger thing. But in his new home, there are going to be, like, new people around that can take a better position in his life. Um, and what I mean is I think that it's an underlying uh, thread throughout the story that there is... A father relationship that he is searching for and that uh, is what propels his loyalty to Rhett and his belief in like caring what Rhett thinks of him and how Rhett looks at him and I'm curious to does this situation that you know he finds himself in at the end of the book does that put him in a position to where he no longer feels that he needs that um, or is it something that he still uh, he he still has to come to terms with? Um, and I, I say that as someone who was raised by my grandmother, so I wasn't raised by either one of my parents. And I know that at 30 there are still things and situations in which not having my parents, especially my mother, uh, in my life has played a part in the outward uh, external relationships outside of my family that I've had. And so I'm definitely curious because uh, I, I, I just think that there, I think there is a, a lot there. And I think that there could be another story in that. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm just eager to see where that goes. Uh, so you guys, you know, this was the first Books and Hooks. I'm not entirely sure, you know, the format of what I'm going to do going forward. I did like just kind of sitting here talking about, you know, my thoughts and feelings about the book. And I tried to cover all the things that I thought that I felt like I, I hadn't heard people speak on uh, before concerning the book. And, you know, like I, I didn't speak on things that I know other people are have spoken on specifically. Like I didn't speak on Clyde because like, child, what is there to say? Really? Like what? What are there to say? Um, and I, I, you, the the main things that stuck out to me were the foundation relationships, especially like being someone who grew up in the hood and understands that the hood has its own way of dealing with things and doing things, and there's a code that comes with that, and seeing that play out. Um, and someone that was different from me. Uh, so yeah, so all in all, I, I, I appreciate what the book is. Um, I am glad that I read it. I, I will be reading it again because I, I do want to see if there are some things that might make me be like, okay, I do like this book. Um, I do like this story. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. And I'm not saying that it's not possible. Uh, so I do want to thank you guys so much for taking the time to watch this video. Again, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. It's just something new that I wanted to try. And I, I think I'm going to aim to do more like the crocheting on the actual camera. But y'all at the same time, when I'm like in the mode, it's like, eh, it's just easier to just let me talk and move my fingers, you know. Uh, but again, thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day to watch this video. I hope you have a fantastic day. Uh, if you've read Black Buck, tell me what your thoughts are on it. You know, if you disagree with me, if you feel that I, I don't know what I'm talking about, it was the best book in the world and you don't know how I couldn't like it, tell me about it. Be respectful because, because God don't like ugly. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm be good. I'm gonna be good. Uh, but yeah, keep it respectful. We can uh, agree to disagree on uh, certain things. Not everything, because some things I'm never gonna agree to disagree on is the right that black lives do matter. Ah, see y'all in the next one. Bye.